testing your words. Testing, testing. Okay. No good luck. Ring, 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 ring. Ring, ring, ring. Hang on, I got. Ring, 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 ring. There it is. Ring, ring, ring. Sounds ring. like the phone. Oh, hang on, wait, hang on. Well, hello. <laughs> hello. Paul, is that you, mate? It is indeed, yes. We in the Guernsey bunker. We are. We're going live stream tonight. Well, what are we going to do tonight then, Gregory? Well, I hope you know, because there's something sitting on your lap and it's not a cat. Well, I'd notice it's not a cat. Well, we're going to talk about what the islanders in Guernsey and Jersey did during the occupation when they didn't have a mobile phone. So how could they write to each other all over the world? And also the Germans didn't have mobile phones either. So we'll explain to the public how they operated the postal system. How's that grab you? Let's step back into 1942, German occupation of Guernsey. 40. Oh, you want to go back that far? <laughs> right, eh? We might as well go back to the beginning. <laughs> what the hell? <laughs> Tart. Right, eh? Let's go back to 1940. So, time machine, <laughs> activate. Let's do it. Welcome to Guernsey Bunker live stream. What have you got for us there, Paul? Well, you've got to appreciate, at the beginning of the occupation, well, prior to the occupation, we all knew the Germans were going to come. So the population was 44,000 on Guernsey and 20,000 evacuated the weeks before the Germans got here. Prior to that, some of the... Uh, eligible young men joined the armed forces um, but when it got close to the uh, Germans invading the women and children went first and then older people in total 20,000 people went so once they got to the UK how could they communicate with their family back in Guernsey there's no postal system, uh, obviously, uh, no telephone, telegraph was cut off, so there's absolutely no way. But the International Red Cross came in and they, they had this message system that you could uh, write to each other from occupied countries and get a reply back within probably three months. Uh, anywhere in the world. It's quite a marvellous thing. When in Guernsey, the first bureau, the Red Cross Bureau, was set up in January 1941, and there was a guy in charge called George Bradshaw, very clever man. He organised the whole thing, and people were possible to, to write to his, their friends and family back in the UK and then get a reply back. And here we have the first English forms that were sent. From the UK, and this one's coming to Guernsey. Uh, basically what happened, the forms were sent uh, through through the Red Cross Message Bureau in, in the UK, they were shipped down to the south of England, then shipped in bulk to Portugal, Lisbon. From there, they got shipped to, uh, railed up through uh, Spain, France, Switzerland, and all the way back again so that the, the forms were censored by the Germans, the Swiss, the French, everybody had a look at these forms to check that there weren't any dodgy messages. This one is quite interesting because 
it's been censored by the German uh, army over commando de Wehrmacht and that's their censor mark on it and then it this was sent in 44 and there's a reply back from Guernsey but they're only allowed to write 25 words and it, 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 it was always censored so you couldn't say too much but once, once this message went back and forth the Germans allowed the Guernsey people to send a message and this was on, on their German Red Cross message form uh, shown here and again it, it, it goes all over the place it, that's the English censor, that's the German censor, that's the Swiss censor goes around the world and then it comes from Guernsey to UK and it comes back again and with their message back from the UK again 25 words can't say anything very interesting so but what kind of messages were relayed? well it's just really a keep keeping in touch telling them you're still alive and well basically after that you can't say too much anything a little bit more um, interesting will be censored and cut out or, or just blocked out February 17th, 1942. Can you read the content of this this one on, on the front and the back there? Or what was the original message? Or was this the reply or the... Yeah, dearest Cyril, received messages, thanks. Barry thrilled and remembers everyone. Birthday greetings. Also, Ken, everything fine with Les. Don't worry. Love, Barry, Ruth and Les. I mean, it's really just saying you're, you're safe and well. Yep. Uh, literally you can't can't squeeze much more in but the, the fact that this this operated right through the war very successfully uh, was a marvelous marvelous thing and it was all thanks to the international red cross the what what happened when when the message came in this this message would come into Guernsey uh, to the message bureau which started originally was in Elizabeth College then it moved to High Street, Market Street, it kept moving around different offices. Um, when it arrived there Mr Bradshaw would send um, an advice card saying you've received the Red Cross message through the um, Red Cross system please come and collect it and these, these are actually known as Bradshaw cards so, so you go and collect it after, after a while they, they decided to post them and there's, they just put them in one of these window envelopes which is a standard Red Cross envelope from uh, Geneva and it would just arrive in the post free of charge and there's no, as you can see there's no postal charge on it at all no stamps, nothing so that would just come, come through to you and the same happened in England. When it got to the Red Cross Bureau in England, it would be forwarded on in one of these envelopes or a similar brown manila envelope. But the beauty of this system, you could write from anywhere in the world. And here's a... Was there a, a postcode system or how, how were the addresses... Can well, it, it all went the same route. Yeah. It had to go, had to go um, wherever it started. This one, for instance, was sent in 1943 from India to Jersey. But this wasn't just a, for civilian communication. This was to yeah. communicate to your loved ones to, uh, you know, in the field. Was it? No, no, no. This, this, this was this purely. Purely in the, in the main, these these were civilian message forms. The forces had a different set set up, with the exception of people fighting in the Middle East, Egypt, etc. Uh, they had a record system there, which I'll show you in a minute. But this this how strange this is. I mean, there's obviously somebody relative in India. 
of, of a person in, in Jersey wanting to know how they're getting on. An even more obscure place, Sri Lanka, which was Ceylon. Again, this one's into Jersey. This must have been an extraordinarily expensive system to fund. How did they manage to continue diverting, you know, ne needed funds from the war into a into a communication system like this? Why? What? Why on earth? Particularly considering that most of the messages aren't sort of life and death messages; they're just they're familial. They're they're checking that people are okay. How did they justify? maintaining the expense of running a system like this? Well, the, the International Red Cross has always, always been, in times of war, uh, available to help. And uh, this, this, uh, this system worked flawlessly right through the war. It's quite, it was quite incredible. Uh, that one's from Canada into Guernsey. Can you read that? What was the original message there? Dear Tom and Gertie, hope all well, had letters from girls, all well here, chins up, all our love, thinking of you. Again, it's just really to say we're, we're thinking of you, we're alive, you're, you're alive, please send back a message to say how are you, you know. And was there a reply to this? Mm-hmm. Now, what, what happened here, this was sent in 1944, April 44. Yep. And as you, as you well know, June 44 came D-Day and we got cut off here. So basically this form may have got here just in time. Uh, yeah, it's gone through Switzerland in 44 uh, in May. So it may have just got, got here um, before D-Day. But after D-Day, we couldn't send any messages out. So we're, by then, we we're, were totally cut off. So if they did send a message back out, it wouldn't, wouldn't get delivered till after the war. In fact, if, if it actually got as far as France or, or anywhere and moved through the system, it would have been held in Switzerland and delivered after the war. But this one didn't get this far. As you can see, there's no, no reply at all on the back. So they'd arrived here, but they, they obviously said, sorry, but you can't reply to it. Mm -hmm. So what checks and balances were in place then to prevent this system from being abused and, and used for the well, conveyance of military intelligence? Well, uh, just just everybody, the, the Allied and the Axis had their own sensors. So everybody had a, a look at this message. Um, if it originated in Sri Lanka, then the Sri Lankan uh, sensors would have looked at it first, then it would have been moved on to um, Switzerland, then to through Germany, everybody has a, a poke at it, and if anything untoward is in the message, then they'd either uh, block it out completely with indelible ink, which was quite successful, uh, or just cut it out. In uh, your collection of, of this correspondence, do you have any examples of of um, of editing that, that's occurred? Well, yeah, it, uh, obviously. It, it had to be somebody from Australia. <laughs> right, eh? President Company accepted. But obviously written something a little bit um, contentious and they uh, blocked it out. But to prove everything was that the Germans actually did this. What I, did, I forgot to mention, every form, you s uh, most forms, they did them randomly. But they did this chemical wash, this blue, with a, like a, a literally a brush. Um, it, it's copper sulfate um, in, and in water.
And they'd, they'd slosh it over every, there were not a random amount of messages just to ch check that there's no invisible ink writing or anything like that. So that was the Germans did that. But here was the, the one from Australia. Uh, that's coming to Guernsey. They've obviously written something a little bit uh, naughty and then they just put that ink through it so it's impossible to read it. But it wasn't bad enough not to send send it on and they it got here in time before D-Day and they managed to um, reply to it. Again, Ralph's family evacuated, it's quite interesting, um, all well. Really, there's not much you can say. It's just, it's just touching, touching base, really. Yeah. But there, there is an exception it, with with the Red Cross. If you're in the um, Middle East uh, uh, theatre war uh, and being a, a British Tommy, you could write to your family uh, through the Red Cross instead of using the forces mail which was uh, a completely different system, you could do one through the uh, Red Cross. But this, this guy was in the Royal Army Service Corps, um, MEF, Middle East Forces. And he was obviously um, in Egypt, and he managed to send a message to Jersey using the Egyptian Red Cross. Again, this is all part of the... Um, International Committee of, of Geneva um, that you can see there's a Egyptian sensor there where before it sets off the, the, the sensor are at that place would sensor it so the, the Egyptian sensor it first then then it's gone on it's gone through Switzerland that's a that's a Swiss date stamp that's a German sensor then it, there's another Swiss one. Then it finally got to Jersey, and it's got this bailiff's inquiry service cachet on it. Is this a is this a a, a, a raised? Yeah, that's a, a, a that's a Jersey. You can't can't really see it, but it's it's um, an embossed stamper with the Jersey crest on it. So uh, that was, that was um, stamped as it came into the um, island. So a typical correspondence like that has passed through how many hands? Well, only basically only only allied and axis at, and once, and uh, the the sensor at the um, place of origin. Uh, and in this case, it's um, Egypt. Uh, actually, there's not many unusual caches on these. It'd be so tempting, though, to use this carriage service to 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 pass coded messages. Ha has anybody studied that? in the years after the war or, or do you think because it's such a contentious idea that even if it was known it would have been repressed because of the value the overarching value of this system well basically the, the as you took it into the your, your local red cross office they you, you they'd ask you to write it out by hand uh, your message i mean you, you yeah. obviously don't type up your message this is done in, in the Red Cross Bureau. So if you took it in, you were in Guernsey, or the, as in this, this chap here, he was in Egypt. He'd take it into his Red Cross Bureau and say, I'd like to send this message, and he just write, scribble it on a piece of paper. They'd then look at it and decide whether he could send it or not. So it, it's your own people are looking at it and if there's anything on toward they will not send it mm -hmm. so basically i've seen spurious messages but i've never seen anything deliberate that's got through so i've been
develop the ink or, or cut out. Yeah. But whereas this, the Germ German, that, yeah, th this one went through the uh, OKW, which is the Oberkommando der Wehrmacht sensor. So up to 1944, all the mail was censored by the army. But they did, like, like your suggestion, they did sort of start thinking, well, hang on a minute, this is a way to get messages through, albeit coded. Um, and the Germans got so suspicious, they decided to uh, take it away from the army, because they didn't trust the army. And they, the Gestapo took over in 1944, sense of all, all our Red Cross messages. Wow. So they tied up a valuable, valuable resource in, in the Gestapo just to read <laughs> 25 word messages from all over the world. I mean, they, are, they must have had sensors, linguistic um, qualified sensors from every <laughs> known country to be able to censor all the mail. Do you so think at that point in the war, it, it's, it, it became paranoid. known that, it, do you think it was just paranoia or do you think yeah. that, that some intel had, had sort no, of driven that? No, I don't, I don't think that basically the, the, at that time politically, the Gestapo just didn't trust the army anymore. So the SS were deciding to take over uh, many of the army duties, uh, right down to this, this bu almost bureaucratic level. It was a bit, a bit crazy. It was, a, it was a silly thing to do, a waste of resource. But it, it's, it proved to be a very good thing. But after, after the D-Day, the channel islands were cut off, so we couldn't get messages in and out. But in the Christmas 1944, we had the Red Cross ship Vega come to Guernsey with uh, Red Cross supplies, mm -hmm. food, tobacco, um, chocolate, mostly food, <laughs> um, which, which saved the day because the, the islanders were starving by then. But they also, because they con they're connected with, uh, th the ship would travel from Portugal, um, where Red Cross messages were in transit, they just they brought over on the first ship and, and several of the uh, subsequent ships that came. Uh, they brought over a summary of the message. It's just it basically that they didn't send the entire message form, but they just handwrite this message. And this came over to Guernsey and Jersey, and then our local people transcribed it onto a, a message form which is a different to this one uh, and we managed to get a few hundred messages through uh, which were quite useful because I mean, the people were dying you know and, and the family would want to know mm -hmm. so, so uh, but that's that's basically all, all, the, all the way the only way you could get any message through by then it was hopeless. But the Germans didn't fare much better. I mean, they, they, they couldn't just operate their post exactly the same as a civilian would do. When they, when they first came here in 40, uh, July 40, there, there was uh, elements of the 216th Infantry Division Army of France came and they brought their fail, po fail post system, which is th th the way of posting letters for the soldiers, brought their system over with them. But it really wasn't, it was only a temporary setup, so it wasn't really s ideal for the soldiers. But by uh, uh, August, the 319th Infantry Division came, uh, which replaced the 216th and it became the whole islands were under the 319th Infantry Division 
and they set up the field post system. So every soldier could send basically as many letters as he wanted back home, well, basically back home really, uh, and he could receive messages through the through the through the field post system. S send th send them back to to family at known addresses, or to send them to to, to mates in the service. No, no. Uh, uh, yeah, you could send them to anybody you liked. But how would you be able to identify the location of of somebody uh, who's in the field? Yeah, uh, that's uh, that's a good question. And it's quite simple, really. The Germans had a very good system. Every unit had, had its own felt post number. And this gentleman here is... I know he, he, who he was anyway. He, give, he was a good writer. That's the Corporal uh, Ka Kaspars. And he's riding home here to his wife, yeah. Frau Kaspars. And that was his unit number, 24200. Like a postcode, but it was mobile, it moved with the unit? Yep. So wherever you went in, in the theatre of the war, if you got if you moved, I mean, everybody moved around. But once they got here, they tended to stay here. Um, but before he came here, he still had that number. Um, that was recognised to be in France at, at that t given time. Yep. Now it's... Uh, recognised when this was posted, he was in Guernsey, uh, but only only the fail post system knew twenty four two hundred. Ah, oh, so this information n never moved through civilian hands. So there's no way that you could have no. triangulated the whereabouts of units no, no. based uh, on uh, a system. And this this uh, this has uh, got the original letter, but you won't find anything uh, appertaining to Guernsey. Um, the guy guy wouldn't put his Guernsey address at the top of the letter or, or mention Guernsey or anything through, because that, yeah. that was censored as well. But basically, as long as you've got their the fail post number, you can check the list of where that unit was. Mm -hmm. So we can prove that there's no information there on, on that car of where it originated from. Um, there's, n there's no mention of Guernsey at all. But but because of this number, we can prove it's had to be sent from Guernsey at that date, which is, um, you can check, double check with the date stamp on the file post. And that was a pretty successful thing until, again, D-Day came along. And uh, again, we were cut off. Mm -hmm. So the Germans couldn't get anything sent out. They did have a, a very big radio station here, a uh, signal, sig naval signal station, uh, St. Jacques, I believe you've been there, and that had a fantastic antenna that could transmit to Berlin. So the soldier was allowed, I think, one, one message a month, something like that. He could send a message and it went on uh, by radio to Willems Harbin and then put it onto like a postcard, transcribed onto a postcard and sent to the, the address. So they, they could still have limited contact with their people back home. But that was that was it. There wasn't really much. But if those signals could reach Berlin, they could reach UK, Bletchley Park, they must have been overwhelmed with the sheer amount of chatter, uh, or, or chatter, radio chatter, that they were constantly mm, having mm, to record and, mm. and in interrogate for, you know, for, for, for intel. Because yeah, what's but again, like again the, 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 the Germans would have censored their own mail, yeah. so it would only be probably, I don't know, I can't, I can't recall what's on a radio message card, but I think it's probably 25 words or something yep. like that. And so it'll be a, I'm, I'm well, how are you? Yep. So, so with that radio, <laughs> yeah. so with that radio telephony system then uh, be transcribed into written form and enter the Felpost system in Berlin and then be distributed well, in Willem, this way? Willem's uh, it was uh, 
uh, transcribed and posted on in, in postcard form. Okay. It, it literally is a special radio card. Um, and I think uh, there was a code for a different seal, I can't recall what it was. Something like Dunkirk or something like that. Uh, they're, they're particularly rare. I've got one in the museum, but you don't see many. So I in your underground museum, you've got a, a, a letter that was sent from a radio transmission from Guernsey mm. to mm. to Germany and then transcribed mm. into, into this form and, and on forwarded. Yeah, I mean, the Germans were, were in a way, just as badly off getting correspondence through at the end of the war, well, yeah. from D-Day onwards. Because once we, we became a festival, a fortress, we were literally cut off. Mm -hmm. And even if they could get a message out, that doesn't mean they could have got a message back through the same system. So you might be able to tell your, your mother that you're still alive, but you don't know whether she's still alive yeah, right. because they, they could have been, had the was that bombed to hell, you know. Was, was it a one-way system? So that if you wanted to get a message out, were you, were you able to get a, a reply back using that radio system? There must have been some some system, but I've never seen seen the actual um, a, a, a return message transcribed. This must be incredibly collectible. This material, and in terms of collectors, do they do they hone in on particular particular elements of, of the whole? Well, uh, it, it's. It, carriage services? Unfortunately, it, it is quite collectible. Therefore, people do naughty things. If something's worth money, then you, you, can, you fake it. So what happened? D during the war, there was a guy called Hennig, a German, who, who set up a, um, a stamp sort of collecting thing do with the Channel Islands. It also happened in places like Crete, where they produced their own stamps as well during the, their occupation. But when in the Channel Islands, the, the stamps were so collected by the soldiers, sent home, it became quite an important but, thing. But the, the stamps had no value within the, the carriage service. They were just a, like a tourist sort of postcard, yeah, were yeah. they? Yeah, well, you know, People always collected stamps, yeah. so, so this was the sort of like, God, these are only going to last a very short time, they're going to be very collected. So the Germans were s buying up all the Guernsey stamps and sending them away, and and the people started thinking, well, th th this is quite good business. And a guy called Hennig started producing covers like this. Right. It looks perfectly sensible, doesn't it? It's got a Jersey bell post cancel on, on a, a Nazi stamp. Yeah. And a Jersey hand stamp, which would have been a Jersey head post office cancel during the occupation. It's mm -hmm. dated 1944. And I can buy you 50 of those. What, this is a fake? This is well a contrivance or? It's a contrivance, yeah. This is what we call philatelic. It was produced for for stamp collectors. That's never been through the normal post. So it's contemporary to the time, but it was actually... Yeah, but w w we believe um, this, this chap, Hennig, and some of his colleagues had, had these cancels and continued making them after a war. Yep. Which is easily done. And, and I mean, when you look at it, it's got this cachet on um, Michnell boot, which just means this has been sent through by speedboat. I mean, uh, to be honest, how ridiculous is that? I mean, it's just it's just an invention, but it's it's pretty and it look, people collect it. That that will sort of still fetch ten or fifteen pounds or something, twenty five dollars, whereas. A, a genuine 
thing that's gone through the fail post system like that would be more like 40 50 pounds and it's not it's not so attractive but it's, it's the real thing it's been through the post that's never been through through any postal system as though it's got postmarks on it it it's, it's, it's a perfect it's yeah yeah it's just a, a naughty so h how educated are, are the uh, are the collectors out there you know, because if this kind of material turns up on the internet, yeah. to the uninformed, they're going to think that it's, it's something nice. that actually entered the, yeah, it the looks carriage very service. Nice. Yeah. And, and no catalogues actually catalogue these naughty things. They, they'll they catalogue everything you can research that, and it'll all, it'll all look authentic. I mean, yeah. that's a genuine council for Jersey. That's yeah. a genuine Felpo's council. The stamp's genuine. I mean, everything's genuine. The fact that it's it's a contrivance is uh, that's the killer. It means it's worthless, really. Although, as I say, people still pay ten, fifteen pounds for them. What about the more expensive uh, collectible items? Are they being faked? I mean, well, uh, Red Cross messages. The the basic form, uh, UK to Channel Islands or Channel Islands to the UK, there was hundreds of thousands sent. And being personal objects, people kept a lot of them. But they're, they're quite they're quite common. So you would you wouldn't really want to machine up to make make things like that because they're easily available, mm -hmm. genuine ones mm -hmm. for 10, 10, 15 pounds or whatever. So you you that wouldn't need to. Even the rare ones from India, Ceylon, I've seen them from Argentina, Peru, unbelievable, everywhere, every country you can think of, I've, so I've seen it. I, some years ago I had a, a Red Cross message from Barbados to Guernsey in 1943. I mean, it's just crazy. Those that will, you could produce and fake and, and probably sell but it's too it's too much effort really I don't, nobody's nobody's attempted to fake this stuff yet but that's why in a way it's quite it's a quite good area to collect because it's not been apart from those fell post covers yeah the the postal items are, are generally okay are, are there many serious collectors out there who are trying to tick you know, tick the box in terms of every oh, country represented, or you know, what what does a typical serious collector look to 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 Well, there, there's fortunately, fortunately there's been people uh, prior to me that studied the Red Cross message system through in the Channel Islands, and there's m some major books written on it, so you can use those books to find what what you need to collect what you haven't got yeah and as the war f uh, progressed they started off with a, a basic uh, UK form then they did, then perhaps three months later some bureau bureaucrat would say well we think that should be um, slightly different typeface on it so they print a new form so for a collector this carried on all through the five years, mm -hmm. four, four years, mm -hmm. so there might be ten different varieties of that basic form, and this happened with the German forms, and also overseas forms, so there's a lot to collect, uh, yeah, it's quite a, quite a big thing, I mean, I know, I know some serious people, and they're, they're from your neck of the woods, Australia to America, uh, they're very interested in the Channel Islands. So there's global interest in this material. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So it's, a, it's a good thing to collect. Fascinating. Fantastic, brilliant material you brought along. Anything else you, you that we can we can pop back here just for a closing shot, or if people want to know more about this material, can they contact? You through the underground museum, if they, or if they want to start well, uh, collecting, or they had. If they want to start collecting, there's a society, the Channel Islands Specialist Society. Just Google that, 
um, join that. The Channel Island Specialist Society? Yeah. Okay. Uh, that, that covers everything philatelic, um, postal uh, items, postal history, postcards, all, the, all that sort of ephemera as well uh, for all the Channel Islands. Is most of this stuff in private hands or, or are there li libraries that have acquired it or well, seek to acquire it or is it something that's under the radar for them? Well, it's mostly in collectors' hands. There's, yeah. no, there's no institutions buying it. Right. Um, our, our local archive services are not that interested. The County Museum is not that interested. But then the, the Occupation Museum and our, our museum cover it quite well, so yeah. there's no need for other people to do it. Well, if people have material like this, um, perhaps in, 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 in at home that's been handed down or found or discovered in an attic or whatever, um, is that material that you, you'd you'd be happy to to um, oh, you know, become a custodian of and, and, and bring well, into the museum because... It, 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 yeah, well, I just advise people. I mean, we, we just advise people uh, regularly. They want to know what they've got. Yeah. They're not they won't necessarily want to sell it because it's family, mm -hmm. but um, they're interested to know what it's all about. I mean, it just looks... It does look a bit strange. Uh, it's not a normal letter, is it? No. Uh, and also, in 40, uh, a totally different collecting field, in 43, the Germans deported a lot of people from the islands to Germany to uh, an internment camp. Mm -hmm. uh, they were allowed to send messages from those camps to Guernsey and Jersey and so on. Uh, so that's, an that's another field that we could discuss one week. But I think I think people had enough of <laughs> messages this oh, week. It was ter <laughs> terrific. And, and we're very lucky uh, today because we've got, I Ines has been helping us with our audio, so we'd like to apologise, or I would like to apologise for the, the problems that we've had probably since we started. It was a small gremlin. <laughs> we've had a few gremlins. But we, we have, have an official sound engineer yeah, and everything working over there okay? All right, eh? Well, <laughs> thanks, Ines. It, it, and is there anything it else? Work. Pardon? It does work. It's great. Well, anything else that we should cover or we should sort of s sign out? Because it's been well, a pretty good one today. Yeah, without sort of diversifying too much, I think we've covered that, that aspect quite well, really. Yep. I mean, at the end of the, the war, there was a, a major interest in the Channel Island stamps that was issued during the occupation. And there were several dealers over here, and it, it became quite an international thing. Uh, to such a degree... There were seven dealers on the island? Several, several. Oh, oh several, yep. Yeah, that, that mostly... <laughs> They were. They had to run their business and do a lot of business with the soldiers because they they thought these stamps were real real novelty, and they'd buy loads of them and send them back home and whatever. And it, it, it's it's helped helped the island a lot because internationally, we're, our stamps are known, our occupation stamps are known. Yeah, which is give us a little bit of a, uh, a boost to tourism and whatever. But it's an interesting subject. And the, the Germans were very, very aware at that time. There was an interesting set of stamps. The Germans tried it out. They, they used their British stamps and decided to overprint them with a swastika. Oh, beauty. And, and, and jersey on them. Yeah. So they did several sets of these stamps, sheets of them. I guess it means they didn't need bead stock, did they? They had a, a ready well, it supply. Well, was, it, was, it was sort of like rubbing it in, really, because yeah. it was like got the king's head on it, yeah, right. our king's head on it. <laughs> with a swastika. Yeah, with a swastika and jersey stuffed all over it. They... Sent the, sent the proof copies to Berlin 
and the powers that be there said, no, we don't like this idea, it's, it's a bit of a bummer, and they told them to destroy all the sheets of stamps that they produced. But people are people. Some, somebody managed to keep a few sheets. Yeah. And one set was sold in Curlow's auction in Berlin in 1942 for something like 2,000 marks or something. In 1942? Yeah, they'd actually some, some soldier or whatever, or the commandant or whoever, pinched one set, sent them to an auction in Germany, and they made a, a stack of money. That set was sold recently. That's why I know um, it's totally genuine. But it, it, it's just a simple overprint. And, of course, they've been faked by the ton. Oh, wouldn't they? So, so, so that set, that set, I think, made something like £30,000. Yep. But the provenance was, was assured. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Any other sets that you see get offered from... Fifty pounds upwards. Don't buy. It's just a facsimile, facsimile. How many stamps in that set that sold for for thirty thousand quid? It goes up to the shilling, so probably about a dozen, I suppose. So you can see how lucrative that would be for a faker. If, oh yeah. If a sheet of a dozen stamps, if they could sort of <laughs> cajole <laughs> somebody into. Well, you you can get the original stamps for. A, very small amount of money and just stamp them over with the swastika and that's yeah. it, simple. Yeah. yeah. So those, those are a no-no. If you ever get up a dose, you just don't buy them. Pr pretty crook that the, you know, the whole uh, stamp collecting fraternity's dogged by fakes, I guess. Well... Well, it probably always has been since the, the has, very first has. stamp, you know? Yeah, yeah. Um, People don't realise that in 1840, when the first stamp came out, which was a Great Britain penny black, um, probably the first stamp catalogue was produced in the 1860s. Mm -hmm. So people, even at that time, people were collecting stamps. And although there was only probably about 50 stamps in the world to collect. Yeah, <laughs> right, though. Because, I mean, uh, Australia didn't start producing stamps till... I think the 1850s. I mean, everybody was a lot later producing stamps, so there wasn't many stamps to collect. But people started collecting them, and uh, they've collected ever since. So, but for where where there's money, there's somebody going to be cute enough to produce forgeries. They're not fakes; they're forgeries. If somebody finds mat material like that, we that we've discussed today if they sent you a, an email or, or, or you know or a scan or something of it would would you um be able to assist them in in determining the problem so how do you yeah how do, how yeah. do you delineate between the, the fakes and the and, and the genuine stuff well if it's a postage stamp such as the over the, the swastika overprint the ultimate way of getting it checked is to send it to the Royal Philatelic Society of London. Of, uh, of which you're a member? Yes, yeah. And they have an ex uh, expert committee, and that will be sent to perhaps 10 different guys, mm -hmm. all with specialist knowledge in, in the Channel Island stamps. And each one will examine it and, dis and put, put his opinion. And then you get a, a written certificate saying your stamp is a dud. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, or your stamp is perfectly genuine. But if you ha if you and have once you've got that certificate, yep. that's that's um, uh, yeah, that, that's. If you don't have the provenance, gold. but you can obtain that certificate, then and and, yeah, and your intention yeah. is to sell, yeah, or or, yeah, or, yeah. or to insure that material, then you can do that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, um, but that, that's the only way you could actually guarantee you, your stamp. Yep. You need to get that certificate. Huge responsibility on the shoulders of, of uh, the men and women that that um, 
provide that certificate and, and, and vouch for it for authenticity. Yeah, there, there are. In Germany, there's a nice um, uh, group of people. There, there, there are experts, committees all over the world. Um, so you, if, you, if you're convinced your stamp is 100% right yeah. and the, the royal says it's fake or forgery or it's been messed around, changed, something added to it or whatever, mm -hmm. uh, you could all take it to another expert uh, committee, perhaps in Germany, and they, could, they can give you a, an opinion as well. But generally speaking, if you've got a bad certificate from the Royal. Yeah, yeah that's it, right. It's, it's a bummer and it's very expensive to get things checked. And, and uh, you get a fair bit of pushback from the, from the subsequent agency if they, they were privy to the fact that you'd already had a dud certificate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Well, but if in doubt, don't buy or buy from a very reputable dealer. Yeah. Um, ultimately, if it's big bucks, you want a certificate. <laughs> get a certificate. Well, I think we need a certificate to say that we, we uh, provided the, the uh, online community with a very informative episode. Well, I hope, time. I, hope, I hope they're still with, awake out there. With, with, <laughs> I hope so. With, with at least intelligible audio. Is that right, Ines? Yes, yes. Thank you. Yeah. Well, well, we might, we might uh, sign off. And, okay, and, yes. And, and, uh, it's goodbye from you. It's good, and goodbye from him. <laughs> <laughs> and, Jerry. and cheerio, thank you for tuning in to Guernsey Bunker. We will endeavour to be back on the air on a... As, Regular as soon as possible <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, perhaps a little bit of odd music too to finish off yeah wonderful who John. are you thinking <laughs> i don't know mate right we'll find something okay. righto cheerio ciao Bye. okay who are you gonna what music are we have pocket if i know <laughs>